Will the Democratic Republic of Congo's disputed election results lead to a historic transfer of power or violence? Zimbabwean doctors call off their crippling 40-day strike as the government equips hospitals. And a closer look at the buzzworthy gadgets from the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. We begin our broadcast tonight with the disputed presidential election in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Election officials in the Central African nation sparked surprise and outrage by declaring opposition candidate Felix Chitsakedi as the winner of the December 30th presidential poll. Now, the man who was predicted to win, opposition coalition leader Martin Fayulu, says the election was a shame and is prepared to challenge the results in the nation's constitutional court. Viewers Anita Powell has more from Johannesburg with additional reporting from Amos Wangwa in Nairobi. At long last, after polls marred by delays and disorder, Congo has a new president. And it was something of a surprise. Mr. Felix Shisekedi is provisionally declared the elected president of the Democratic Republic of Congo. The vote and the counting were rife with delays and problems, and provisional results were delayed until 10 days after the poll. Pre-election surveys suggested that voters favored opposition candidate Martin Fayulu, a newcomer to politics, over ruling party nominee Emmanuel Ramazani Shadari. But after Shisekedi, a son of the former opposition leader and a late entrant in this poll, was announced the winner, Fayulu cried foul. This attitude from the CENI raises various legitimate suspicions that fuel political tension throughout the country. Shisekedi's camp said they had been negotiating with President Joseph Kabila long ahead of the handover which would be Congo's first democratic transition of power in decades. The two personalities have an interest in meeting to prepare for the peaceful and civilized transfer of power. But analyst Claude Kabemba says the real power is, and always has been, behind the scenes. Oh, Joseph Kabila, we said directly or indirectly is going to stay in power. And I think... Uh, we might have a prisoner in the presidency. And, and for me, that is uh, it's scary. Unless I'm wrong, but uh, judging from what has been happening behind the scene, it's, uh, and if Chisekedi cannot rise to the occasion, he will be captured for a very long time. The delays in the election process triggered protests. The results, say analyst Richard Moncrief of the International Crisis Group, may do the same, especially among Fayulu's supporters. There will be a lot of anger. That anger will spill over onto the streets, I'm quite sure. Uh, a lot of people, f uh, uh, a lot of his supporters will agree that he won and will see a victory for Tiskedi as a stolen result, so that's very dangerous. Protests or a peaceful transition of power. Congo holds its breath. Anita Powell, VOA News, Johannesburg. In Southern Africa, hospitals in Zimbabwe have started admitting patients again after doctors in the Southern African nation ended their crippling 40-day strike. Doctors started the work stoppage demanding better pay and working conditions. They returned to their posts on Thursday after commitments were made by the government to address key issues and concerns. The government says the strike resulted in patients unnecessarily suffering and some dying. Columbus Mavunga reports from Harare. Patients trickled into Zimbabwe's largest treatment center Thursday as doctors called off their strike after 40 days and returned to work. One of the patients is 48-year-old Phyllis Mukundu, who has had chest pains for over a month, but due to the strike was unable to get treatment. Mukundu struggles to walk and talk and requires help from her mother. I am happy to hear that the doctors are back, but my daughter is yet to be attended by any of them. I am looking forward to her full recovery, then I will know that their return is good news. It has been a long time that she has been in pain. 
Zimbabwe's doctors went on strike December 1, demanding better payment and medicine for hospitals and to be paid in US dollars instead of Zimbabwe's currency, the depreciating bond notes. Health officials Thursday showed reporters the new hospital supplies the government provided to help end the strike. We're going in the right direction. We're very happy that they're back. You know, we always want them to be back at work. We've always called for everybody to be back at work. And we're happy that they've heeded the call. Because it's for the benefit of all our patients. It's for the benefit of Zimbabweans. Announcing the end of the strike, doctors stated that President Emerson Munangagwa's government made their demands regarding the equipment and medicines. But the doctors considered on one of their key desires to be paid in US dollars. While the compromise could weaken the position of teachers also striking for US dollars, for patients like Mukundu, the deal could be a lifesaver. Columbus Mavunga for VOA News Harare. The war in Yemen has taken its soul far beyond what is reported in terms of military casualties. Guns and bombs are claiming lives, but hunger is another major threat to Yemenis. The World Food Program and the Food and Agriculture Organization says 73,000 Yemeni civilians are facing famine, and another 14 million are on the brink of starvation. Aid agencies say more than 1.8 million children under the age of five are acutely malnourished. Neha Wadaka has more from Yemen. Lina Ali Sanatsuha is three years old, but she's barely larger than a newborn. She and her mother fled fighting in Tayas three years ago and came to this informal displacement camp outside Aden. First, she started vomiting. Then her sickness worsened. Nadia Ahmed Ali works for the International Rescue Committee and helps malnourished children like Lena. As a result of war, when Lena first was admitted, I was the one to receive her case. She had severe dehydration because of the conflict. Both the mother and kid didn't have proper nutrition, and this case continued because they are IDPs. Relief workers say they're also battling the effects of poverty. We found many malnutrition cases, but the sad thing is that whenever a kid is sent home healthy, they come back malnourished. That's all because of the bad economic situation of the families and also access to clean water issue here in this area playing a big role in their relapse. Many displaced persons don't have access to clean water or money for food. Abdul Nasser Nasser runs a grocery store in the camp. In terms of the people and their lives, prices now are very expensive. We are selling, but we cannot even control the prices. Displaced persons continue to flood into Aden in search of food and assistance. Al Sadaka Hospital in the port city of Aden is the only referral hospital in southern Yemen, which means that all complicated cases are sent here. The hospital already doesn't have enough medicine to treat its current caseload, and as the offensive in Hidaida intensifies, doctors say it's only going to get worse. If the hospital stops taking patients, it could mean death for children like one-and-a-half-year-old Saba Mohammed, who has had pneumonia and is malnourished. Her mother and father, Mohammed Bahul Mohammed, fled Hidaida and made it here in time to get Saba treatment. What happened is that we didn't have a hospital equipped to treat our child. We suffered and became displaced. We went to Mocha, then to Aden. We are very tired. We hope things will get better for us. Muhammad Ali of the World Food Program in Aden urges world donors to make Yemen a top priority. I've been here two and a half, almost a half years, and situation has been deteriorating rather than getting back to normal. And you will see that the demand also is getting higher, and with the closure of also today's port, that has played a significant role in terms of access of food to the people that are required. The U.S. Senate has voted to end Washington's support to Saudi Arabia in the war, and U.N.-led peace talks in Sweden yielded a tentative ceasefire. New steps in a war that has pushed millions of Yemenis to the brink of starvation. Neha Wadaker for VOA News, Aden, Yemen. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. 
The address is Africa 54. You're also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter, VOA Vince McCory. Still ahead on Africa 54, Gadgets Gallo from the Consumer Electronics Show. But first, a look at Friday's headlines. In the DRC, opposition candidate Martin Fayulu says he'll file a legal challenge to the official results of the country's presidential election after another opposition candidate, Felix Tshisekedi, won the December 30th election. Miss Algeria, Khadija Ben Hamou, from the country's vast desert south, becomes the subject of social media attacks because of her darker skin color. Ugandan entrepreneur Nordin Kasoma recycles damaged steel bicycles, replacing frames with bamboo ones in what is part of a growing entrepreneurial culture in the country. In Nigeria, an eight-year-old wins the arts and creative personality of the year 2018 at the Nigerian Child Summit Awards. Finally, in Tunisia, the Esperance Football Club prepares to celebrate 100 years of existence, showcasing its achievements over the years. Eight hundred thousand U.S. federal workers are not getting paid on Friday as the partial government shutdown nears its fourth week. The sticking point to reopen the government, uh, Democrats are refusing to give President Donald Trump more than five billion dollars to build a wall along the U.S. southern border with Mexico. Meanwhile, President Trump visited the border with Mexico Thursday to reiterate his demand for wall funding. VOA's Patsy Widakuswara reports from Washington. President Donald Trump went to the Texas-Mexico border to make his case for a wall. A caravan's forming right now in Honduras. It's supposed to be bigger than the other caravans. We will handle that as it comes up. If we had a wall, we wouldn't have any problems, but uh, we don't, so we will handle it. President Trump met with officials and families who described the crime, drugs, and human trafficking crisis at the border, a crisis which Democrats accused Trump of manufacturing to get the $5.7 billion funding for the wall. The fight has caused the government to partially shut down for three weeks. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi urges Republicans to pass the bill to reopen government. Just to go um, recap in terms of uh, the soap opera that the president's petulance and obstinance is creating, we all support border security. The president threatened to declare a national emergency to sidestep Democrats in Congress, even if it means a legal challenge. We can declare a national emergency. We shouldn't have to, because this isn't even, this is just common sense. There is so much at stake politically, it's hard to see a way out, says Stephen Billett from the George Washington University. This is a critical component in his re-election effort. It was a critical component in his 2016 election. Immigration and border security were the issue for him. And he's going to ride that issue as long as, as he has to. Meanwhile, in Washington, several hundred people protested against the closing of the government. Many were furloughed federal workers living without paychecks during the shutdown, now just a few days away from being the longest in history. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News at the White House. Federal workers who are not being paid or are working without pay during the partial government shutdown were the first to feel its impact. Other segments of the economy are also being hurt, especially here in Washington, home to the largest number of federal workers in the country. His viewers and Cook with that story. As a partial government shutdown continues, businesses from local restaurants to rideshare drivers in Washington are feeling the hit. I'm trying to work to make a little extra money to make a living for myself, you know, it's pretty tough. No customers uh, coming here. We cannot pay our rent, we cannot pay salary. It's too much. The prolonged shutdown only has negative effects on the economy and businesses across the nation, says Sam Berger, who was a policy advisor during the 2013 shutdown. I think according to the White House, it's like two and a half billion dollars a week. And I think it's it's not just though the, the straight numbers of the economic effect, it's the hardship that's being sort of rippling throughout 
the challenges that it's posing uh, for small businesses. Despite the impact the government shutdown is having on local businesses, President Trump continues to push for funding the border wall with Mexico. The only solution is for Democrats to pass a spending bill that defends our borders and reopens the government. Congressional Democrats oppose the wall and believe Trump is holding the country hostage to deliver on a core campaign promise. People in the capital city are frustrated by the standoff. Uh, right now, it's so slow. It looked like it was really dead this morning. No action, nobody around. Whatever you're asking for, give it to them. Because, <laughs> you know, at this point, it hurts everybody. Since the shutdown began in December, some restaurants have been offering free food at a designated time of the day to help furloughed federal employees who are not being paid. From 6 to 8, government furloughed workers get free pizzas. And I think that's awesome because there's so many people who aren't able to make, you know, ends meet sometimes. On Saturday, the shutdown becomes the longest in U.S. history. Anna Cook, VOA News, Washington. The death of dissident journalist Jamal Khashoggi, killed just moments after entering the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, sparked widespread condemnation of Saudi Arabia and renewed fears for the safety of journalists worldwide. VOA congressional correspondent Catherine Gibson reports on how U.S. lawmakers are keeping the focus on press freedom 100 days after Khashoggi's death. The final glimpse of journalist Jamal Khashoggi as he unknowingly heads to his death. Raida has said his killing was the fault of rogue agents, but President Trump has held back from criticism of the crown prince, saying the relationship with Saudi Arabia is too important to risk. We're not going to give up hundreds of billions of dollars in orders and let Russia, China and everybody else have them. It's all about, for me, very simple, it's America first. Uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, if we broke with them, I think your oil prices would go through the roof. The U.S. Senate passed a resolution in December condemning Saudi Arabia for the murder of Khashoggi. And now, 100 days after his death, he is receiving renewed attention, with Speaker Pelosi calling out Trump's decision. If we decide that commercial interest should override the statements that we make and the actions that we take, then we must admit that we have lost all moral authority to talk about any atrocities anywhere, anytime. 2018 was a deadly year for journalists, including five shot and killed in Maryland. The U.S. sets the example for treatment of journalists worldwide, said that state senator. The absence of a strong voice in freedom of the press in the White House puts in danger journalists around the world, copycats, authoritarian leaders around the world who quote the expression fake news and any enemy of the people and use that as an excuse to lock up journalists in their country. Two jailed Burmese reporters part of a troubling movement towards less transparency. When we look around the world, it is hard not to conclude that the trends are getting worse, not better. Remembrances of Khashoggi also received Republican and support. So, so I realize the difficult uh, places that y'all have put your yourself in. Even in his rural South Texas district, Heard said Khashoggi's death got the attention of Americans who had never before considered the worldwide dangers for journalists. This has spurred a conversation in South and West Texas. Uh, most people in South and West Texas have a hard time producing, you know, saying his name. Um, a lot of people have come up to me and say, why is this important? It is causing a lot of people to remember why our press is so important. An awareness lawmakers said would be part of Khashoggi's lasting legacy. Catherine Gibson, VOA News, Capitol Hill. But in Malawi, bodybuilding and bodybuilding competitions have long been regarded as a male-only activity. But 33-year-old Doreen Kambatira is changing that perception. Kambatira is the only female bodybuilder in Malawi to be actively involved in competitions and has made a name for herself in fitness circles. Two months ago, she participated in a bodybuilding show for women held in South Africa, where she placed fifth. Lemek Masina reports from Blante. Doreen Kumbatira never intended to become a professional bodybuilder 
when she first began working out in a gym three years ago. An avid cycler, Kumbatila, says she went to the gym simply to build up her strength and confidence. But then she had a realization. I saw that there are other avenues in bodybuilding, especially for women, like competing for fitness shows. And, and that's how I got more interested in bodybuilding, to see what else I can do with it. Now, Gumbatira has become Malau's only female competitor in this male-dominated activity. She takes part in men's local contests. And two months ago in South Africa, Gumbatira was among the contestants in the gentle giant bodybuilding show. Here she came in fifth out of the eight female contestants in the bikini fitness category. And I was very excited about that and I've learned a lot from that experience. And next year I'm sure I'm gonna do very, very well. A single mother of one child, Kumbatira owes her love for sports to her father, a former national soccer team goalkeeper who used to take her for physical exercise when she was a young girl. We could climb the stairs at Kamu Stadium 20 times, up and down one, up and down two, until you do 20. And we used to be very physically fit. Eh? As young people, yes, we were, mm, we were okay. So probably she take a little bit of those genes from me. Even though Kumbatila seems to have broken the glass ceiling, many Malawian gyms remain male-dominated. This is largely because women fear bodybuilding will make them lose their feminine appearance, something Kumbatila discounts. Um, I still have my feminine curves, I still look like a woman. So it's because of that. As women, we don't produce that hormone and we cannot look like men. Malau's National Weightlifting and Bodybuilding Association plans to engage Kumbatila to promote its sports development program. We'll be moving around with her just to have a talk to some of the women who may be able to, to join the sport because we have seen that uh, uh, other women, they are there, but they are shunning. Herself with money she earns from baking, graphic designing and architecture, a field in which she earned a degree. She is now working on various projects to raise funds to participate in more international competitions next year. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Blanta. Welcome back to Africa 54, and here's what's trending. At the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, there are gadgets as far as the eye can see. For example, meet Pillow, a robot whose job is, keep, uh, is keeping patients on track, whether it's appointments with doctors and contract, uh, contacting relatives, as well as ensuring people take their tablets on time. Pillow is aimed mostly at older people that might need a reminder now and then to take their medication. It's a growing market with families keen to help their elderly live, uh, rather live independently, safely. Uh, the, rob uh, the robot functions through facial recognition software. Pillow can also create a, a health plan for seniors, including doctors' visits and reminders to eat well and exercise. It retails for $449. Among the highly technical gadgets at the CES, a few devices aim to help people to get back to nature. Uh, the Gossam Fire Fusion Solar Cooker even allows people to disconnect from the power grid. Vegetables will need about 45 minutes in the cooker, meet a bit longer. It can also generate electricity by using its solar panels in after power, a small refrigerator to keep food fresh. The thermometer connects to an app. The cooker can also make breads, vegetables, or soups for up to eight people. The solar cooker is available for order in May and will cost $449. But and finally, meet Wobo, a cuddly toy that is also a smart assistant. assistant. It's able to listen to children's questions and provide answers, such as why is the sky blue, to prevent children asking inappropriate questions Bobo is fitted with a, a kid-friendly question answering system. It also has a host of interactive games. If a child asks an inappropriate question, Bobo will say, let's ask an adult, 
Or let's find someone who's older than you to answer these questions. The Smart Companion is currently available to order only online for $149. And that's what's trending today. Well, we end our show tonight with a Congolese artist, Cappuccino LBG, and his song, Ayodona La Danse de Guerrilla. From our entire team here in Washington, have a good night and a great weekend.